Hello, my name is Xander and welcome to version two of the Django e-commerce project. If you have looked at the previous version of this project, thank you very much. I don't want you to feel as though that was a complete waste of time. This is going to build upon version one, as well as uh, we're going to cover some of the similar steps that we took in version one, but I'm gonna change this up slightly. We are going to be looking at a testing first approach here. So there's gonna be many changes, even at the beginning of this project, because we're going to try and set up a solid base for us to move forward in this project. So one of the biggest problems in the first project was there wasn't enough testing. Now in general, I think that can be applied to many other tutorials that you may have watched or many courses. They just don't do enough testing. And what happens or one of the things that potentially happens from a learning perspective is that you make mistakes and there's no way of you finding out easily where the problem occurred potentially. So by having a testing first approach, that's gonna help better guide you uh, in finding problems and resolving these issues yourself and ultimately having a better experience with the tutorial, ensuring that potentially there will be no more questions ever from you in regards to my code is wrong, um, what's the problem? So that will hopefully go towards eradicating those questions and giving you a better experience in terms of your code actually working or you being able to actually work out what the problem is through following a test first approach. No surprises, we are going to be utilizing Django, whatever the latest version is at this moment in time. And we are going to, in this tutorial, bear with me, utilize the Django templating system, at least to begin with. Now this project will jump straight into using, utilizing Postgres database. So we will set up Docker. We will get a workflow with GitHub uh, ready from the very beginning. And that's gonna give us a great base for us to move forward. Again, building large applications, it really does require a lot um, of thinking in the beginning because you want to make it easier for you to work as the project gets bigger. So not having uh, a robust testing in place as your application scales, it becomes a lot harder to find and resolve problems potentially. So hopefully we're going to eradicate all of those problems by setting up and building a firm base for this application so that we can move deeper into the project. So at least at the very beginning, this project will be a Django Django templating project. So we will be utilizing Django templates. We will eventually utilize the base because we are going to be focused over the first couple of tutorials, building a base which will then be utilized for not, even, not only Django templating, but we can then convert it for Django DRF and then GraphQL. So that's the plan. We're focused predominantly on this string first, Django templating to a point, and then we'll adapt all that over to Django DRF. Now I will, through the development, be thinking all the time about how I might design my application so that it can be utilized for template Django templating and potentially DRF GraphQL at the same time. So that's gonna be a definite consideration when we're building our apps and maybe deciding what apps to build or breaking our software into smaller components, thinking about how that's gonna be then utilized later on with DRF and GraphQL. So for now, we're going to continue utilizing and starting off with Django templating. To support this project, I've decided to develop some documentation to go alongside this project. And at the moment, there's a limited amount of information here, and I will keep developing this over the duration of the project. But what you're going to find here initially is a, a very simple project brief, and that's just going to give us some background, some context, so that when we are deciding and making decisions on different aspects of the project, we have something tangible, we have something feasible and realistic that we're working towards. So this is a snapshot of the project brief. Like I said, this can change over the duration of the project. But here, our project brief is to build an online store um, which can sell various branded merchandise. So these are the type of things that are really important to understand because this 
this single element here will alone will reflect in our database design. We're going to need to store various branded merchandise. So for example, information about a telly that we need to store is different from, for example, a t-shirt. So we're going to need to build a dynamic database which can allow for all these different types of attributes that need to be stored in our database, for example. Another feature of this project will be the live chat help desk. So here I'm hoping to show you a little bit more in-depth information about Django channels to build a live chat help desk. Customers will be able to click on a button, type in their name and wait for someone to get back to them from the company to talk about whatever they want to talk about. So you may have already utilized this type of feature in a website. So we're going to try and replicate and build a live chat help desk. So let's get started building this project. Now we have a project brief. We've got a general overview of what it is we're going to build. We are going to break this project down into smaller chunks here, and then we're going to tackle and build these individual components of our project as we go along. So first of all, we're going to start off by building a system so that we can store and manage our products. Typically, the first step in your project is to build a database. Now we could go ahead and build a database for all of the different apps that we're going to need to build to ensure that we have built everything that's described here in our project brief. But we're going to break this down. Like I said, we're going to start off with product. So we are going to focus on product and build the tables that are going to be needed to store and manage our products. Database design and modeling are some of those topics which strangely rarely get any attention they deserve in other tutorials and courses that I've seen. So in actual fact, this tutorial is an optional tutorial. I'm going to be taking you through the steps of building a database or the tables needed for our first app. And by the end of this tutorial, we, we would have then discussed, we would have built, discussed, evaluated our set of tables that we're going to move forward. And then in the next tutorial, we're going to then start to apply that in Django, build our tables, test them and so on. So yeah, if you do want to skip this step, then by all means do that and move to the next tutorial where we just start building the database. So let's take a look at the final design here. So this is what we're going to be working towards. You can see that we're going to be storing products and we have a product and product inventory. We have product catalogs, weight, brands that we're storing, stock information. And then over here, we're handling the different attributes that we might want to develop for different types of products that we want to store, as well as media, which is really referring to images that we want to store about our products. There is a lot to unpack here. This tutorial is by no means a complete in-depth tutorial on database design. So I appreciate that for new developers, following a step-by-step -step guide, you kind of expect to be told everything that you need. Now, in this case, it's, it's kind of impossible because the amount of information here would take us around about six or seven hours to potentially unpack. Now, I'm trying to squash as much information in as I can in one tutorial with the expectation that you will top up your knowledge with additional resources. Now I'm pointing you to this resource here because I'm going to follow the steps and guidelines presented in this book specifically so that you can then follow the steps in this tutorial. Then if you do have any problems, any questions, which of course I cannot always be in at hand to answer, potentially the answer will be with in this book. Now I'm not affiliated at all to this book. I'm not going to make any money from you purchasing this book but I am recommending it as a good book for new developers learning relational database design. So at this point, you probably got an idea of what we're going to be doing in this tutorial. We are going to be building a, a database for the first app that we're going to build for our e-commerce project. And in this tutorial, we'll go ahead and build the logical design following the steps in the book. And then we we'll go ahead also utilizing Lucidchart, which is a free software online we'll go ahead and build a database ERD. And that will also help us in the design stages to realize the tables and fields that are going to be needed and the connections between the tables. 
like I said previously, you don't have to do this tutorial. I'm not trying to put you off at all. It's just a case of some people already have this knowledge or not be too bothered about how the actual database is developed, which is absolutely fine. In which case, move across to part two or the second tutorial, which obviously at this point hasn't been created. But if you're watching this later on, it's probably been developed. So go ahead and go straight to part two, where we just get going with Django and actually start building the tables, testing, of course, a testing first approach to building the tables. As I previously mentioned, generally in Django, we tend to break the application down into smaller components. It makes it more manageable for us to build and test. And of course, we can separate components up within our project to make them reusable. In this tutorial, we focus, like I previously said, on the inventory app. So our first target is to build a database for our inventory app before we start building it. So yes, that was the whole purpose of this tutorial, isn't it? So to go through the steps of building the database before we start then actually building our inventory app. So here is a mission statement for our inventory app database. So this database needs to be able to maintain the data that is needed to support online retail sales and stock inventory management. So it's very clear here in, in a way, although this is fairly broad, it's very clear um, what this database needs to be able to achieve. We need to be able to store the data that's needed for us to uh, sell products online and also for us to actually be able to um, manage the inventory that we might have. So by that, I mean, for example, if we're selling t-shirts, we may actually physically have them in our stock room. So we're going to want to maintain a level of stock so that we know that we always have products available for our customers. So we're going to need to potentially track the quantity of stock we have. The mission statement can be broken down further and we can have objectives. So the whole premise here is that these objectives as long as we met these objectives through our design, we would have also then met our mission statement. So in some respects, the objectives here are just a breakdown, a breakdown of all the stages, steps um, that we need to take in order to fulfill our mission statement. OK, so our mission objectives here then are to maintain information on multiple types of products. So our database needs to do that. And then more specifically, we need to keep track of stock levels. So these are our objectives or our design objectives, if you like. So as long as we meet these design objectives, um, then we will could be sure that we've also then met our mission statement and we're ready then to start building our infantry app. Now we have some clear objectives and clear goals for our database for the infantry app. We can now start potentially thinking about the fields that we're going to need to have in our tables or in this case, or you can look at it this way, what data we need to store within our database. At this point, depending on your scenario, your situation, you may choose to undertake a range of activities to help you generate the fields or the data that needs to be stored in the database. So for example, you might start to undertake some questionnaires, interviews, you might analyze any existing databases uh, to seek out what data is needed or required in the new databases. And that's really just to name a few different approaches. So in addition to that, you may also take the approach where you start to build interfaces. So for example, here we're building an inventory app. So we're going to need some way of actually inputting the actual product. So why not kind of draw out the interface where users are going to type in the product? And that way, as a designer, we could think about what fields are needed that way. And that will potentially help us understand the fields that are going to be needed in our database. So we could take that approach to collect new data or discover what data is needed or what fields are going to be needed in our database. We might simply just ask ourselves a few questions. What is what needs to appear on the website? Obviously, customers are going to need to buy products. They're going to need to be able to see the products. What data will they expect to see? What do customers need to know about the product? That will help us determine what data we need to store in our database and show to the customer again. And also, what data is needed to record stock level or to manage stock? So that's going to help us determine what, um, what fields, what data we're going to need to store in our database, for example. Of course, this is just an example. There are many other questions we could ask ourselves, but I'm just trying to... Uh, give you a, a general idea um, if you're stuck about where to start generating fields. 
So I've gone ahead, simply just had to think about what data might be important to store if I was going to store a product in my database. So this is my preliminary list, field list. So this is all the data that's connected to what potentially will be a product in this case, but we'll have a look at that shortly. So I want to store the product name. I've just called that name, product description. We're going to need SKU. So an SKU is essentially a a number that uniquely identifies a product. So for example, if you had an e-commerce store, you actually had a, wa a warehouse full of products. For Take for example, this t-shirt here, it might come in different colors and sizes. So you're gonna stock every single color, every single size. So for every item in your stock room, that will have, or every product will have an SKU, a unique identifier for that particular size, type, color for example. So it's just a unique identifier for each product. Now I was going to say everything else should be self-explanatory and in some ways I guess it should be. You should be able to look at your data and it should make sense uh, maybe initially. That's not always going to be the case um, but it's a good place to start. If you want to easily understand the data that's being stored, it's a good to follow a pattern or good practice when naming Field list. Now we will talk about that later. So let's just take a look at this here. So the only things that maybe might stand out here is RR price, so retail price or retail recommended price. So typically the manufacturer of a product may give guidance um, to the sellers in terms of what price you should um, sell the product at. So a recommended retail price. So here the stock price refers to the actual price of the product that's being sold in this e-commerce store and then the sale price the actual if the product's on sale that's the price when the product's on sale again the end of this we have stock quantity so i could look at these fields here and then go back to my mission objectives here and i could match these up so am i maintaining information on multiple types of products um, maybe not, but I have got different attributes I'm storing, keeping track of stock level. So it does look like I'm doing that because I've got a field called stock level. So there I would have a number which would indicate how much stock I have of that specific product. Because we are only focusing on a small subset of the bigger database that we will create once we fully develop this e-commerce store, it makes this process actually quite simple. And we're actually finished now with the prelim preliminary, preliminary, pre preliminary field list that we have here. Now, it's probably worth noting at this point um, that this set of data here really is just a fundamental set of data or core requirements or core set of fields. So we could go ahead and we could add some more fields here. For example, uh, we could add when the stock when the um, product was added for example so maybe we add a new field here called uh, added at or updated at field so we can also then track when the product was updated we could also then add a user because we will probably also want to know who updated it so we could add more here but i'm just trying to uh, go through this process this design process with a fundamental or core set of fields and we're going to add those fields later in the process. That concludes the first stage of identifying the fields and as I previously said that could be a much longer process if you have multiple tables or multiple goals. If you're building the whole database that's obviously going to take a little bit longer. So now what we're going to do is establish some tables we now have a general idea of the fields, of the data that we want to store in the database. Now we need to connect that or establish what table those fields are going to be placed in in our database. We are going to start this process by first of all analyzing the preliminary field list. So our objective here is to identify subjects that's implied by the fields in the list. So here a field represents a characteristic of a particular subject. So name or product name is a characteristic of the product. So this is the product name and the description 
is then a characteristic of the product. So this is product description. So that's a, a characteristic of the product. So a type, product type, product image, product color, product size. So these are all potentially characteristics of a particular subject. And we've already identified that subject as product. So going through each of these fields here, I'm loosely going to place this or suggest that there's one subject here and that's the product. So from looking at my field list here, I've determined, determined a subject. In this case, just one subject, one table, and that's the product table. Just to expand upon this slightly, let's just imagine, I won't write this in, but let's just imagine we also had username in our fields list here. And for example, address. That then potentially implies that uh, those are characteristics of another subject, which might be the user. So the subject being this user, we would create a new table called user and potentially those fields would then be associated to that table as an example. So that's one of many ways. Of course, you may over time gather enough, gain enough experience for you to just go ahead and start building some tables. That will potentially become just natural to you once you've built a few databases. The second step here, which you can take is have a look at some of the collected data, your interviews, questionnaires, etc. And from that, you can then potentially determine some of the subjects, the things that you want to model in your database, some data that you want to collect about particular subjects. And then last of all, you may utilize, for example, your mission objective. So if we looked at our mission objective here, we need to maintain information on multiple types of products. So that's helped us um, because we've now looked at product information. So we've got products as a subject and here keep track of stock levels. So what we have is a field, if you remember, in our products table called stock level, I think, or stock quantity. And now we're recording the amount of stock we have about a specific product. Okay, so potentially we've already uh, fulfilled our objectives here through that simple design. Now, just as an example here, if we wanted to, if this mission objectives were to expand to keep track of users' interactions, that's suggesting here that there's another subject. So we have product subject, and here potentially we have users. So that's something else we need to model or keep um, information about. Of course, we don't have that in our mission objective. So this is where we end this step. We've now set out our subject, our first subject, which is product, the product table. And we're just probably going to assume now that this, all these preliminary fields will fit inside of our product here. That was a little bit casual. So I think uh, just to formalize that, now we've identified the subjects. Each of these items here represent a characteristic of a particular subject. So what we want to do, any characteristic that is identified to a subject, we want to place those fields inside of that, of that box, of that, um, of that table there. So we could write that out in Excel or whatever um, so that we've identified where these fields fit. So that's a process we could have gone through next. Here I've not done that. I've just simplified it here because I'm just saying that all these, all these uh, fields here would just fit inside the product table. You might at this point start to think about actually building this table in Excel, particularly if you're new to database, it gives you kind of a perspective of what your data is going to look like inside of your table. So a table here, we have a number of columns at the top here. We have all the headers. So these are all the fields that we've identified, uh, name, description, shopkeep unit, SKU, type, image, color. And what I've done here is I've just placed an entry like it would appear in the database. So a t-shirt, generic t-shirt, or we call that t-shirt one. Um, it's going to have a description. Now this t-shirt one will have multiple colors, etc. Now remember what we said previously, every color, every size will have a different SKU. So we put all the different SKU numbers here related to this t-shirt. So that identifies all the different types of t-shirts, red, blue, small, large, etc. And we have a type, which is a t-shirt. We have an image, there might be multiple images. We can have multiple colors. So this t-shirt one is gonna come in multiple colors, multiple sizes, the brand name, it's gonna have a weight. It might have multiple weights. The categories it's going to appear in. 
and then we might have the prices and the stock quantity. Now this stock quantity here probably refers to all the stock in terms of all the different items that we have of all the different types of varieties of this t-shirt. So we're now at the business end where we start to refine the fields. Now this process here is going to start to shape our database. So at the moment we've, we have one table with a load of different fields here related to the product. Now you're probably wondering how do I get from one table to all of these different tables here? So the process that we're going to go through next, we'll start to um, shape our data and we'll start to see how these other tables are formed. We are going to follow a four step process here detailed in the book I previously mentioned. So first of all, we're going to improve the field names, talk a little bit about field names, best practices to follow. That's going to help us shape our data, resolve any structural problems. Now at the moment, we don't know we have any structural problems and I'll take you through a process so we can start to identify some problems and the reasons why they are problems. And by going through a process, another set process defined in the book, we will then be able to create more efficient, a more efficient design um, for us to then retrieve and store data in our database. So by doing that, we will refine the tables and then we'll also then go ahead and assign any appropriate fields based upon the changes that we've made. Taken from the book, here are five characteristics that we want to try and follow when building field names. So field names should be unique, descriptive and meaningful. Take for example, earlier we saw one of the fields that we created, or I created, uh, are our price. That probably wasn't very descriptive. It wasn't very meaningful, potentially. So we want to try and avoid, like it says, abbreviations at the bottom here in number five. Uh, so try and avoid that potentially. Now that isn't always going to be the case. Um, so this is just guidelines, of course. So we want to try and make sure that our field name is accurate, clear and, um, and ambiguous in terms of defining what it is um, the specification we're trying to define with with our field and what data we're trying to store within that field. So name is accurate, it's clear. We all know what a name is or product name. So that's an example maybe of a, a good example. So we want to try and avoid and we want to try and use a minimum number of words when we're defining field names and avoid words that convey physical characteristics, file, record, table, for example. And then number five, try and avoid where possible acronyms and abbreviations. And again, this is really dependent on the situation, right? So you will probably find a lot of acronyms utilize in tables. So this is just for guidance. As a bad example, then let's have a look at our product table. We have all these different fields. You can see in blue here, I've identified fields that we might, there might be some contentious or we might have some discussion about. I'm happy with this field set and we could change this, but not using SKU, using um, the full name, that's quite a long name. So in this case, SKU is quite uh, intuitive. If you're working with e-commerce databases, you'll see this quite often in databases. So we can say that, um, for example, in this case, it's a commonly used acronym um, in this field. So seems okay to utilize in my opinion. So again, it's going to be opinionated um, up to you, of course. I'm probably talking too long about it. So let's move on. We have now finished improving the field names. So let that be a guide for you in any of the tables that you create. Let's now move on to resolving any structural problems. Now we're going to go through a sub process, which in the book is identified as ideal fields. If you do have the book I've recommended, it's well worth spending as much time as possible in this section of the book and to apply it to many different situations. So maybe just come up with different scenarios and try and apply it to those scenarios because this really is the most critical aspect or critical aspects of the development process. So every single individual field in our tables must comply to these requirements here. So we're going to go through a step by step. Let's start with the top one and we'll go through and through this process where we start to see our tables changing. The first requirement 
each and every field in our table needs to represent a distinct characteristic of the subject of the table. Now we've already been through this process because when we created our fields, we then selected the table or we've selected the corresponding uh, subject, which the characteristic, the field is representing. So we've probably gone through this step already. So let's take a look. Here we have product and we can comfortably say that each item here, each field here is a characteristic that we want to record about the product. There are a few talking points here. If we were to analyze each of these fields, we could, for example, start to imply or infer that in actual fact, there might be two subjects here because we have a product and we also have a sub product because remember a product um, ha comes in many different varieties, sizes, shapes, colors, for example, if we're just thinking about t-shirts, of course. So we also notice here that the stock keeping unit is relevant or is describing potentially the sub product. So what I'm saying here is the stock keeping unit SKU in actual fact kind of uniquely describes um, or really identifies the sub product and not the product. So we may already have two tables just looking at this list, but I'm just going to move forward here under the general assumption that everything here is related to the product. So hopefully you will agree that generally every single field here represents a distinct characteristic of the subject, the product. So let's just think about that. I'm thinking about this as an actual product in my mind. I'm looking at a product and I'm just thinking, does that describe something about this product? And in most cases, I think we can generally say that is true. So next up, we're going to have a look at each field and ask ourselves, can it be deconstructed into smaller components? Now, we don't really have any fields that fit into this category. So as an example, for example, if we had a table here, user, and we were storing name, and inside of that was someone's full name. So if we were actually storing in name in our table here, Sander Park, um, well, in actual fact, we might want to decompose that into two fields because it might be important when we're running queries or trying to find information or generate statistics, or for example, if it's an address, we have a postcode, it's going to be a lot easier for us to query on individual pieces of information. So in actual fact, this might be considered, this name might be considered a multi-part field in that there's potentially multiple pieces of information that we might want to collect and store individually in individual uh, fields in our table. And that, like I said, can make it easier for us to store, retrieve, maintain, update the information. So I don't really see many of those here. Now, something that, that may, now this is all going to be scenario dependent. What may be broken down is the stock keeping unit because what you might do in your business is for every single product there might be a unique code so 001 means jeans 002 means any shoes and so on so your stock keeping unit might consist of four or five sets of numbers so the first set of number might be the, the product type the second set of number might be the size or the third set of numbers might be relating to something else you, Hopefully you get the idea. So that might be uh, something that will get broken down into individual numbers and stored in your database. That's just an example here. If I was trying to kind of really reach in and think about something that might be separated. Now we come to the interesting part should contain a single value. Previously, I went ahead and I created an example of the table that we built from the fields and the table that we've inferred from the fields. So this is going to be the products table. So I've gone ahead and built a, a set of fields here that we've generated and then I've added some data into the table. The rule here is that every field should contain a single value. So by identifying and drawing the table in this manner, in this format, we can see that we have multi-valued fields and I've identified them in orange. So just go through the process again. This t-shirt, t-shirt one, has a description and has many stock keeping units because there's different versions of it and that relates to the image. So for example, 
111 here refers to the product, which is the t-shirt one, but it might refer to the small, uh, the, yeah, the small size in blue, for example. So this number specifically identifies that product. And remember that product is an individual product that I'm storing in my, in my warehouse, for example. The problem with storing data in this format, you may already have guessed, is that if I were to query my database and for example, ask the database, how many, um, how many t-shirt ones in blue do I have? Well, there's no way of actually getting that information using the design and format that we have here. So hopefully just on that example alone, hopefully you can already see um, that this isn't going to be a very good way, or efficient way of storing our database to retrieve information about specific data in our database. While we're at this point here, we can also start thinking about bringing in business rules, business cases. Um, and one of them might be, for example, that sub products can be sold at different prices. So what I mean by that, if we go back to our data here, that these prices here might be dependent upon the, the individual item. So the blue t-shirt might be selling for a little bit cheaper because there's so much stock of it. So in actual fact, these will also be multi-valued fields dependent upon what stock keeping unit we're referring to. So in actual fact, I'm going to put these also in orange to determine or just to indicate they are also multi-valued fields. Now, in addition to that, this stock quantity is also going to be a multi-valued field because we're identifying the stock quantity based upon uh, each individual product that we're storing. So each individual product, again, being the t-shirt color, size, all these individual products we need to store. So again, that's also going to be a multi-valued field in this case. Now we could also go a little bit further and also say that weight is also because if we're going uh, the route of, well, each version of this, for example, the larger version of his t-shirt is going to weigh more naturally, right? So this could also be a multi-valued field. And we could keep going because also the brand. Now there are some products that has potentially multi brands um, created that product. So maybe in the unique situation, that's the case. This will also be a multi field, um, multi valued field, but hopefully I'm just trying to give you the idea, um, of thinking a little bit deeper about your data here for you to identify these multi value fields. Now we move into a sub sub process. We need to now resolve any multi-valued fields in the table. So there's a three step process here. We're going to remove the field from a table. We're then going to select any connecting fields that will relate to the um, product table, to the new table and add them to the structure of the new table. And then we're going to give the new table a proper name, compose a suitable description and so on. So that might not make sense. So let's just go ahead and do this. We need to move through that sub sub process on individual fields here. So let's start off with category, right? So what we're going to need to do here as described in our requirements, we need to remove the field from the table and use it as a basis of a new table. We then need to select a connecting fields that relate to the product table. So we need to, uh, we need a new field in that new table we've made to connect that field to the in the original field. So let's go ahead and give this a go. So we're going to take category out of this, this field here. We're going to make a new table. We're going to call that category. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that the unique name where we can connect this new table to the product table is going to be the name. So let's go ahead and do exactly that. So we don't need to, we need to copy that down. So this is going to be a, a reference field, if you like, to the products table. So that was the step, the second step. So we removed the field from the table that was um, a problem, a multi-valued field. And then we selected a connecting field that will relate to the product table. And that, what we selected there was the name. Okay, so we've done that. Then we need to give the new table a proper name and so on. So let's call this category, the category table. Now, what we're going to have in here originally is 
for example, t-shirt one, t-shirt one, t-shirt one, men, clothes, and t-shirt. So we now have two tables. We've removed the multi-valued field. We've created a new table here called category, and we now have a linking or a relevant field, which will relate back to the, the initial field. So what we can do here in actual fact now is easily query this table um, to see what categories t-shirt is part of. Well, we couldn't do that before because it's a multi-valued field. So we would return multi-values and we could, we could work with that, of course. But this is potentially a much more effective way of returning information about what categories t-shirt is part of at this point, of course. So hopefully that makes sense at this point. We've now moved category, the multi-field table, over to a new category table. So while we're looking at design, something that you could have so a way that you could have approached your design is that you could have flattened this initial table here. So this is just an example here in green. So for example, instead of having a separate field for each color, the multi-valued field, we could break that up into three fields. So color one, color two, color three, blue, red, and green. And this is very familiar to see students work in this way initially. So that's okay. This will work absolutely fine if there was always, if it was always the case that there was only three colors for a product. But of course, products can come in multiple colors. So the problem you've got here is if you built your database in this way, it doesn't become very flexible. It becomes harder for you to scale this database because you need to actually then go ahead each time there's a new color, add a new field. And that is the same for image um, size and any other multi-valued field. It's hard to always determine how many fields you're going to need and to make sure that your database is flexible for future growth. It's probably not going to be a feasible way of working, but flattening your table like this, if it's a small table, if it's a small database, it could work for you most definitely. Now we can go ahead and perform the same action with all these other fields, but we would end up with lots of tables here. And I've already seen something that we can now change. Now, previously I mentioned potentially here that product isn't the only subject we have. Potentially we also have sub product. Now, if we have a look at these fields here, they are relating directly or describing something about the individual product, what this number is referring to. So for example, yes, blue, red, and yellow refers to a type of t-shirt, but these individual components have a one-to-one -one relationship with one of the items that's in the stock keeping unit. By that, I mean that blue is referring to 111, for example, that's the product that's blue or the blue t-shirt one and red has a stock keeping unit of 122. So in a similar situation here, the weight is related to the stock keeping unit, the retail price. Remember that is flexible dependent upon the individual sub product. So that is related directly a one to one relationship with one of these numbers here. So there's an additional step here where a single or multi-valued field depends on a particular multi-valued field, another multi-valued field, then we're going to fix that problem by also including those tables in the new table that we create. So this is how I've interpreted these rules. Here, for example, we have stock keeping unit, which is a multi-valued field. So naturally we perform the same process like we did with category. So we're going to bring this down and we're going to create a new table and we're going to call this the sub product. Okay, so each number here is referring to a sub product. So now what we're going to do is um, this is the SKU. So I'm just going to now just call this SKU. So two, 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 three, two, three. These are all the individual numbers of our products. So we've got that in place. So following this guide here from the book, we're going to include the dependent field in the structure of the new table that we've built to resolve the multi-valued field. So we can go ahead and resolve this multi-valued field here, red and all these different colors, by moving this down into our table here, our new table. And now these represent 
different numbers here because one we have a one to one relationship. So this product relates to the the blue and this product here relates to the red, yellow and so on. If you remember at this point, we could look at it this way that when we created the initial field set and tried to then determine a subject, we needed to make sure that a field represented a characteristic of a particular subject. So in this case, what we can probably say now is that the image doesn't necessarily um, represent a, a particular characteristic of the name. It's probably more related to a characteristic of a particular sub product because this t-shirt could be blue, it could be red, it could be yellow, it could be orange, remember. So there's potentially now not a direct correlation between the image and the t-shirt, but more of a correlation. This field represents more of a characteristic of a particular subject, and that's the sub product now. So if we used those rules that we set out initially, what we could probably do now in actual fact is take all of these items here, um, and we can now say that they are or they have a direct, or these characteristics um, represent uh, a characteristic of this sub product rather than the actual product here. So we are following the, the two rules, the sub sub rule um, of moving these, um, what are one to one, what will be one to one with this SKU here. But you can see that we're still gonna have duplicated information. So let's go ahead and just remove all these items. So we're going to retain that and that in our product table. So what we can say is that the stock quantity that gets resolved because of each, each item here will have a different stock quantity. So that's all good. And the sale price might be different based upon the different products. Of course, these are just random numbers, apologies. So we've got some numbers here, same as the stock price will be individual. So that's resolved that multi-field value. And then the retail price, same thing again, because we're working from the SKU here, the individual product. So each one has a, re a different retail price. And of course the weight also is also resolved. So that multi-value field is also resolved here when we bring this down and that relates, it's a field that represents a characteristic of this particular sub product. Right, so hopefully that makes sense. That was kind of a big jump. I tried to transition that. Um, maybe you need to go back and have a look at what I've done there. But I've just applied the logic that we used earlier and from that sub sub process. So what we've done here is we've taken a multi-valued out of the, so we removed the field from the table. That was the SKU because it was a multi-value field. And then what we've done is we haven't done this step yet. What we've determined is that this multi-valued depends on particular other multi-valued fields or multi-value fields in our existing products table also depended upon the multi-valued field that we took out and made a new table of. So what we did to fix that problem, we included those dependent fields in the new structure that we created, the new table. So what we need to do now potentially is also make sure that there's a connecting field so let's go back here. What we can do is we're going to need to make sure in that sub process there is a connected field like we did here. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is all going to be t-shirt one. So there's some redundancy here. What I mean by that is that there's multiple um, data. So there's redundancy here in this data, but that we can deal with that amount of redundancy in our table. Right, so let's go ahead and do that. Remove this across. So this is our this is our sub product table now. So it's worth noting that we also, we have, we have indeed also resolved the size. Um, so this is really small, 222 might be large um, and so on. But what we're doing here, if we expanded this data a little bit further is that we would need to basically just add more fields here because we there's a lot of the potentially there are there is duplication here there's redundancy here because um, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need for example if two 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 was also blue because we need blue in for example we don't need that do we uh, we need blue in medium and we also need blue in large so there is some kind of duplication here of data if we were to spell every single product because blue 
this t-shirt blue product needs to be in small medium and large so if we were to kind of build this table out you can see that there would be duplication potentially within some of these fields so hopefully you've you understand that process that we've just taken there utilizing the rules here and the rules in resolving the multi-field um, that we've encountered where there's a dependency a one-to-one -one dependency if you like between the different fields now we probably could have captured that earlier if we went through the path where, or decision that there was two subjects here the product and sub product earlier but you can see that we've come to the same result so what we can now do is iterate over the sub product here because in actual fact this t-shirt 111 it is blue but it will have multiple images it will have a small image a medium image and a large image maybe for example there might be multiple images so this is still a multi-valued field so that's telling us simply that this needs to come out of here and then we need a relating field remember so we're just following the slides we need a relating field which can be for example the name of the sub product let's call this let's call this um, I'm going to call this media or image whatever you like uh, so I'm going to call this media and what this table will now have is for example shirt one shirt one shirt one and we have for example small um, dot jpeg large medium large etc yep so that kind of solves that multi-valued field and Yep, I think we're pretty much pretty much done with that. Everything else now is going to single value based upon the SKU here. You can see there's some redundancy. So there's going to be multiple instances of the same color here and size. So these are attributes obviously of the t-shirt and there's some redundancy here in terms of this data will be repeated and because we're referring that to the the product table but what we have here is a set of tables that makes it easier for us to gather information because what we can say now in a query to collect data is that we could ask the table to provide us all of the for example all of the sub products where the product name equals t-shirt so we can look in the sub product table match t-shirt and we would we would return all this data and we would then be able to determine how many sub products there were of the this product here you can see also that we are preventing the need to have to for example create multiple shirt ones in this one here so we're reducing the amount of data that needs to be developed and this might be a larger table describing this particular product <laughs> here we have a description for example so we're reducing the amount of data that needs to be stored potentially by separating the data in this manner. I have referred to data redundancy a few times. So this generally refers to where the same piece of data is stored in two or more separate places. So you can see here, for example, that the weight, the retail price, stock price, sale price, quantity, that data here is that is going to be generally different potentially depending on each product. But the color and size here, um, there might only be two sizes. So there's got to be a, it's going to be a lot of duplication of SMLM. Now, this, this data here isn't too large, but if it was a larger set of data, that's going to fill up our database very quickly and potentially it's going to create um, the need for more storage and that's going to cost more money. So you might find going through the process set out in the book, you might end up with a few more tables. So you may, have, you may have ended up with the color and size table. And you can see here we have the reference field connected to the sub product table via the SKU and the same situation here with size. So this may have been a valid uh, result based upon following the guidance in the book at this point, or you may have simply wanted to decompose further. Now, the benefit of this at this point may not um, be you, you may not be able to see the benefit of, of this at the moment, but as we get deeper into the process, that hopefully will come a little bit clearer as to why that might be a good, a good design option or choice to follow. At this point, what you can do is go back a few steps and go through ideal fields again. Uh, so represent a distinct characteristic of a subject or field should contain single values cannot be deconstructed into smaller components um, avoid or calculated or concatenated values so we can have a look at these 
principles we've set out and we can match those to the ideal fields or the fields, sorry, that we've just generated. And in addition to that, if we needed to make any new fields, we could just double check the fields to make sure that they follow best practices when building field names. Now, these best practices for field names are very similar to best practices for building table names as well. I didn't mention that earlier. So you can follow these best practices um, when creating fields or table names. So now we can start to see our design forming because now we've developed our product table. We have a product table, we have a category table, an inventory table, or we've called it sub product table. And you can start to see that this has taken shape. So now what we're going to do is move on to the next step where we identified the primary keys for each of our new tables. This is how far we've got so far. Hopefully I've made this really understandable. Hopefully I have. And if it doesn't quite make sense, maybe watch a few times or again, this is why I've connected it to the book to enable you to kind of read through. And there's some more examples in the book, but I have just iterated around the same process. I haven't done anything different, hopefully, um, to what I've described in the presentations and using the knowledge previously to think about table fields and how they connect to the subject. Subject being the individual table, so color, media, subproduct, and so on. So we can say that this field is connected directly to the table uh, subject, which is the color or product color. Just a quick recap, some changes that you might want to make, uh, some business rules here. So for example, we know from the scenario, or we've just made this up, of course, but in your case, this might be an actual fact that products might be categorized under different types. So types might be a multi-value field in the initial table, the weight, I think we've dealt with the weight as a multi-valued field and some products might be created by one or more brands. So that potentially is a multi-value field too. So type and brand might be a multi-value field for you. Now, I think later on, I will kind of deal with that as a multi-valued field, but for now, we're just gonna say that that fits nicely within the product table. So you may be wondering why I'm not dealing with it now. The reason being is just, I think it just makes it easier and clearer the process if we try to maintain the tables in a smaller subset and it doesn't make too much difference and we will end up in the same place. So just really for the sake of learning, keeping it hopefully nice and tight and simple to understand, I've made that decision. So now we've completed the process that we were going through and that was part two, resolving any structural problems. Now we've completed that, we have already kind of gone ahead and refined the tables. Um, it might be that we change the name, go through the best practices again of naming the tables and so on. And we've also then now assigned any appropriate fields. So we've done that already really in this resolving the structural problems. But at this point, you might also want to add some additional fields to your tables that might be relevant based upon the new tables that you've created. Looking at our tables, we could go ahead and maybe think about some other fields that we might need based upon the new tables that we've created. Maybe at this point, it's good to think about adding created at, updated at, if there's a business case for that. So we could add those fields in. We know that potentially that isn't going to affect because it's directly related to our sub product. Uh, so yeah, we, there may be some other fields here that you might want to think about. I can't really see any others at this point, And I want to keep this nice and simple as possible. Now we're going to go through the process of selecting a primary key for each table. So let's take a look at elements of an ideal table. So there's lots of sub processes here and aspects to follow rules to follow. So this is specifically to table. So we saw earlier ideal fields. So now we're having a look at an ideal table. So number one, an ideal table will represent a single subject, which can be an object or an event. So the tables that we've generated so far fit within that parameter or that requirement. So now we're moving to step two, so looking at tables. So I guess we've, we've moved now, haven't we, from first our focus was fields. We've utilized fields to generate some tables. And now we've got some tables. We're now saying, well, let's make sure that these tables are established, they follow best practices, and they're going to work for what we need. So elements of an ideal table, second parameter, it has to have a primary key. So that's the focus of this small section of this tutorial. So the first step, we need to identify 
candidate key. So we need to identify fields that might become the primary key. So we're going to call those candidate keys. So these are fields that uniquely identify a single instance. So once we've done that, we need to then follow a set of guidelines to determine what might be the primary key. Now, remember, we are following this book and the point is here, I'm not trying to plagiarize this book. I have utilized snippets from this book um, just to showcase steps, etc. And we are trying to follow this book in an academic way um, to determine um, the validity of the process within this book and to apply it in a real case scenario. And of course, if some of what I've said so far doesn't make sense, you will find uh, this book will hopefully give you that wider perspective and um, because we are trying to follow the steps outlined in this book. Um, so that's why I keep recommending it um, because I don't want the, the, the author to consider or think that we're trying to plagiarize here. We are just trying to, in an academic perspective, try to follow the steps to see and to validate the process. So I'm not gaining any financial, there's no financial incentive here for me to recommend this book to you. Um, and it's obviously completely optional. So within the book, there is a process here or a set of guidelines to help you determine a primary key. So it cannot be a multi-part field. It must contain unique values throughout the whole table. It cannot contain nulls, so null values. And so it can't be, have empty values, for example, or null values. Its value cannot cause a breach of the organization's security or privacy rules. So for example, we can't have an ID, a primary ID, that's, for example, some sort of important customer number, maybe their credit card number, for example. So that can't be a primary key. It is not optional in whole or part. So yeah, the primary key cannot be optional in whole or part. So for example, the whole primary key must be unique. So it needs to uniquely and extensively identify each record in the table. It must be exclusive in its identification of the value of each field within a given record. I'll explain that in a second. And its value can be modified only in rare or extreme cases. So, yeah, so generally a primary key, you set the key and it doesn't change. It's something that is consistent throughout the life of the data. And it then becomes a difficult process to try and then change. Um, but yeah, primary keys can change over time, of course, depending on the needs of your database. So let's take a look at our tables and let's try and determine and create a primary key for each table. So now we're going to move over to Lucidchart. If you haven't used this before, it's a very popular tool for creating diagrams. So here we're going to create an ERD diagram of our database. So if I just open up the existing diagram here, you can see this is how I built the preview or the ERD diagram that I've been showing you in the tutorial. So to make a diagram such as this, you can just have a look for the shapes ERD down here. We can bring over an entity. You can then go ahead and just uh, add some borders, etc. add some fields. And that's how we're going to build these tables. And what we can then do is we can then, like we'll see later when we build some of the connections between our tables here, relationships. You can see that we can build these relationships, these lines to indicate different types of relationships between our our tables. So that's the really the, the tools that we're utilizing here. Um, you can see that I've gone ahead and styled them slightly. So let's now think about our primary keys. So here's something I made earlier. You will notice that there is an additional table here and this is brand. So all I've done here is I've just gone ahead and followed the business rules I mentioned earlier, whereby a brand, a multiple brand, or let me start that again, a product may have multiple brands. Now this may be a, an edge case kind of scenario. Um, it might not happen too often, but that's what we're going to potentially say here. So in actual fact, this becomes a multi-valued uh, field. And what we can now do is think about, well, in actual fact, we can build a new table. So what we could ask ourselves is, first of all, um, this is a field which represents a characteristic of which subject. And that's probably the case now. We can probably say it's more related to the individual. It's a, or we could say it represents a characteristic of this subject, of a sub product, rather than a product. 
because we could put different brand names here, uh, for example, and we could then be more specific and say, well, this product here has two brand names, four and two, or whatever it might be. Um, apologies with the numbers, they just represent brand names. So you can see this is a, a multi-valued field, um, which was related potentially to the individual sub product. Because for example, t-shirt one, that may have sub products or these sub products here, but one of the products might have been designed and built by two brands. Now, again, that is gonna be uh, a case that might not happen very often at all or at all. Um, but we are going to say in our business rules that, that is the, that's something that we need to model and to consider when designing our database. So brand would go into sub product here. Now, because it's a, a multi-field, we know that we need to split that out. So that would then end up in its own table. And then we need a reference, do we not? Uh, so let's go ahead and use the SKU as a reference back to the sub product table. And there we go. So that then creates our new table. So let's just go ahead and style that. Uh, there we go, no borders, and then tick side borders. There we go, so we've got a new table, so we're just gonna call that brand, and there we go. So let me pass that by you again. So we had a business case that basically said that a sub product may have multiple brands. So what we're saying now then is this field really represents, the brand field represents a characteristic of a sub product rather than a product because if it was a product and we had a sub product with multiple brands it would be kind of incorrectly associated because really it's associated to or dependent upon the SKU what brand the product is so that's how I'm relating or providing your rationale there why brand is essentially a field that represents a characteristic of a sub product and not a product so we moved it across here to sub product and then we found it was multi-valued in some instances. So therefore we then needed to follow the guide that we set out earlier and then create a new table. And then we have a reference field here back to the table it was associated to. So that's why we have the SKU here. So that's how we've come about creating this brand table. So why I left that to now is I thought it'd be good just to recap some of the skills that we learned earlier, just to keep us refreshed on what we learned earlier, the process that we took. Right, so now we can have a look at primary keys. So you can see that I've already selected the primary key for each table. Some of these might be slightly wrong. So we need to think about the media first. So now we've said earlier that a product may have multiple images. So this media table here at the moment has an SKU field and an image field, which is going to store a link or where the image is stored on a hard drive, for example. So this probably isn't going to be a primary key. So the reason why this can't be a primary key is for example, the SKU will be duplicated for every image that we have of an individual product. So let's just take this as an idea. Let's go back into here. And so for example, our, our media here is going to have a uh, oh, name. So we've identified actually name here. So um, that's slightly incorrect. So we're gonna use the SKU uh, to for that. Okay, and then that's gonna be the SQK. So what we're saying here is that the data might look like this. So we might have three rows, for one for small, one for medium, dot JPEG, and then one for large.jpg. So you can see that this SKU actually is duplicating its values. Now, to create a primary key, this value must be unique. So what we're gonna to need to do is, is to make a unique field. So what we might wanna do in this instance is just create a, an arbitrary kind of number or an arbitrary kind of ID that we can use for every single field. That might be the way forward. So we can call this the media ID. So for every field, or every row, for every instance um, in our database, it is uniquely identified by the ID. So number three is unique throughout the whole of our table here, and that identifies this image here with this SQ, okay, okay, this SKU. So 
Um, for example, this SKU, this product here, T-shirt, which has a weight of 100, is also related to this size and this brand and this color. So for all the tables here, we can identify these individual components to build up the story of this particular product. And then we can also say that these images are associated to that product. So if we extracted that information from our database, we now have all the data from a database about the product, as well as now all the images. So these images are uniquely identified by this unique ID that we've generated here. So now we've updated the the fields here in this table, we now have a primary key. Let's just go back here. What we're going to do here is get rid of that. Now what I can do here is double click till I get to the individual field or row. Then I can add or insert a row above. I'm going to call that ID. Now you can see that what's happened here is that it is a different font size. So I can just edit, copy the style and then paste that style and then that will then be formatted like the rest of the tables here. So that's gonna be our primary key. So just for now, I'm just going to type in PK to indicate that. So that's the ID or the primary I key, primary I, primary I key, the primary key of the media table. So let's look at the sub product. Now the sub product data here, we shouldn't be duplicating SKU at any point in time. Uh, so let's go back into our data here. So uh, sub product, you can see the SKU is going to be changed, changed for every product. Now it might be that you need to start to fill up these tables here and start to think about what data you need to store to make sure that this table or this field is unique and it's uniquely identifying all this data. So let's just go back to the, um, the rules here. So it cannot be a multi-part table. It must contain unique fields, it cannot be null. Its value cannot cause a breach, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's not an optional. optional. It uniquely exclusively identifies each record in the table. So it's following all of these rules here. Um, really what we're looking for here is a unique field um, which corresponds to the rest of the row. So this SQA is SQ, SKU is describing all this other data and the weight is dependent upon as a one-to-one -one relationship, if you like, as the weight is dependent upon the SKU here. The retail price of this product is relevant or related to the SKU. That obviously relates to a different size and shape and color and so on. So there's definitely correlation here. It's definitely a good candidate for a primary key. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and utilize and set that as the primary key. All right, so similar situation here with product. Uh, so we've got individual products. We're not going to need to duplicate the product at all. So one product, uh, one row per product in the product table. So the product name becomes the product key at this point or the primary key, sorry, category. So for every category, um, we're going to have a, well, in this case, it's similar to media. Let's have a look actually here. So let's go into our category. Now you can see here there's duplication if we use the product name, because a product might be associated to multiple categories. So in actual fact, what we're going to need to do again is potentially build a, an ID, which is going to be a unique number, which is going to identify um, individual rows. So let's go ahead and, and build that. Let's just uh, move this across. There we go. So you can see that we now have a category table with a primary key, which is just going to be the category ID or just ID in this case. So let's go back now and we're just going to make those changes in our design. So again, double click to get into the individual row, insert a row above, just going to call that ID. That's going to be the primary key for category. Uh, so Let's go ahead and edit, paste the style, and that's been updated. So we're gonna make the assumption here that each product is just one color. Now it might be that most products probably come in two colors, or a lot of products, so not most. Some products come in multiple colors. So in the database, that might be multiple, so you might have a multiple option. So the color might be just be multiple 
referencing multiple colors, or you might have multiple colors. So 111 is blue and red. It depends how you want to store the colors here, but generally it's going to be unique. The SKU here is going to be unique because what we're saying is each product has an individual color. So therefore the primary key in this table, uh, the unique identifier is going to be the SKU. So this is going to be the primary ID because it doesn't get duplicated um, throughout the table. So the color is okay. Size, again, same similar situation. Uh, we're going to say that the product only comes uh, is described in one size. So the SKU, sorry, is referring to a product which only comes in one size. So that's not a problem at all. Now we have said that branding, um, that a, a sub product might be associated to multiple brands, say brand one and brand two and whatever. So here we might have duplicate data. So for example, here, if we wanted to store that 111 was a brand one and also part of brand two, we'd have multiple data. So here again, potentially we're going to need to build a, a unique identifying a unique identifier. So let's just go for brand ID. We're just going to call this ID. Um, so similar situation here again. We're just going to go ahead and create a, a new field uh, for that. There we go. And then we go ahead and update our tables here. So that was brand. So we're going to row above ID. That's going to be a primary key, of course. So let's go ahead and edit, paste the style and we get rid of the primary key of the SKU. And there we go. So I think we've gone ahead now. We've now have a primary key for each table. So ultimately you just need to utilize this set of rules here to help you identify what a primary key is. I have hopefully given you some ideas. If it isn't obvious what the primary key might be, we've created a, an ind individual field called ID, and that will then be a unique identifier at this point. Okay, so now let's move on to table relationships. A table relationship will establish a connection between a pair of tables. This is going to help us further refine the table structure and minimize, further minimize redundant data. So this mechanism enables us to draw data from multiple tables simultaneously. So when we start querying our tables, whereas we've got individual tables here at the moment, by connecting them together, we make building a connection between relevant data. So when we are trying to collect data from our database, we can use these connections to produce or to obtain multiple data from multiple tables. Ultimately, it just makes it easier for us to generate or to select data from our database by creating connections between our database. So we're going to identify the relationships between our tables. There are three types of relationships, one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. -many. For new developers, this can be a little bit confusing to begin with, how to identify these. So let's just go through a few examples. So we have our table sub product and the color table. Let's have a look here. So we've got sub product and color. You can see that the color was drawn from the sub product. We've created the color from the sub product table because we have a reference field here to the sub product. That happens to also to be the primary key at the moment. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the relationship between sub product and color? So in order to work out the relationship, we need to work both ways. We need to first start with sub product and then relate that to color and then the color and then relate that to sub product. And then from that, we can then create this equation and then work out what type of relationship we have. So what we need to do is work from sub product first, say, and we're then going to select or say one product. So initially we say one product. So one sub product for one sub product there is one color. Okay, so one sub product will be associated to one color. That's what we're going to say. So um, let's have a look at our table here. So we're going to say that, for example, this sub product 111, that is associated to one color. So what we have here is a relationship, a one to one relationship. 222, and remember this is a unique field, that's going to have one entry inside of the color table. So we have a one to one. So this use needs to be unique. 
this used, needs to be unique. They're both, uh, in this case, primary keys. So that should be the case um, throughout this, throughout these two tables, a one-to-one -one relationship. For one subproduct, there is one color associated to it. One, 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 blue. Okay, so now let's look at this the other way around. So we're gonna start with a single color. So remember, we're talking about the color here, blue. So we can see here, in actual fact, blue is associated to multiple subproducts. So 111 here is associated to blue and 222 is also associated to blue. So what we can say here is that one color is associated to many subproducts. Many subproducts associated to blue. So for one color blue, that is associated to multiple subproducts. So what we have here is a, a many to one relationship. So a many to, sorry, one to many relationship. Apologies, one to many. So what we end up with is a one to many relationship. Now, that might not make sense to you, and I do apologize. Hopefully we've gone through that in a way that kind of makes sense. So what we can now do is go into our color here and we can then make a connection. So we're saying that our SKU primary key here, um, okay, so we're gonna build a relationship between color and subproduct. So we're saying for one, one product, there are multiple colors. So you can see here this one, this line here representing one and the line down here, which we'll see if we just made that a little bit thicker. We can see that there's a crow's foot here and that represents many. So one to many. So for one subproduct, so for one product, there are many colors. That isn't correct, is it? So what we're gonna say is that for many colors can be associated to one product. Well, that is not right. So let's try this again. So one color might be associated to many products. Okay, so we're saying one color, blue, red, orange, green, whatever, one of those might be associated to multiple, so the crow's foot being multiple, to multiple subproducts. So because we have the many attached here to the subproduct, that's telling me that we need to now build a reference from the subproduct to the color. So let's go ahead and now just insert a new row below. We're going to call this color. But this is going to be a foreign key. So this is going to be a reference to a color that's associated in this table here. Okay. So let's just uh, bring that down to here. Let's do it again. Let's bring, no, let's do it again. So we're gonna bring it down to color. Uh, let's just make sure that we've formatted it. Okay, so this table here is connected to the crow's foot. So we're gonna need a foreign key. So we're gonna need to build a relation between this subproduct table and the color. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna change SKU because that's not going to be needed now as a reference to the table because we're referencing, referencing from the subproduct table to the color. So this is going to turn into just ID, color ID. And there we go. So that's going to be the primary key. That's going to be the unique identifier. So now what we have is a relationship. So for one color, multiple subproducts might be utilizing it or assigned to it. So what's that going to look like within our database now? So if we take a look at this, this is fairly interesting what's just happened. We've now just changed this to ID. So now we're uniquely identifying items. Now this is a unique identifier, which is gonna uniquely identify a color. So in actual fact, what we've done now is previously what we had was an SKU and the color, so blue. And what we had was all these SQK, SKUs associated to different or the same colors, so blue, red, red. 
we have redundancy there. So by building a connection, what we've done is we've reduced the amount of redundancy, the amount of duplicated data. Now this table acts as a reference table. So for every ID, there's a unique color. And it only this color only needs to be placed in the database once. So we've reduced this redundancy quite a lot. And what we're doing now is we're going to add a functional, functional, a foreign key, a reference. So we're going to call this um, color ID. So that's going to be a foreign key to the relationship to this key. Here. So this is going to say one or two or three. Remember, there's a um, one product will only have one color. So there's only going to be one number here reference to it. So these numbers now are going to reference a color ID in this table, which is then going to correspond to a color. So we can see here that this um, product 111 is related to number one, which is blue. So this product's blue. In addition to that, 444 is also referencing one, which is blue too. So here we have a one color to many SKUs. That's, our, that's how we built the connection, one to many. So we're going to add that now to our table. So now we've updated our table here and hopefully you can now see the connection that we built and what we had to do there to create this foreign key and connect it to our table and how that's actually changed the structure of our table and proved the redundancy of the data within our table. So let's take a look at another relationship here, product and sub product. So let's go ahead and see if we can work out the relationship. So we have product and sub product. So for one product, there are multiple sub products. And for one sub product, it's related to one product. So we're going to say for one product, that's related to multiple sub products. Because remember the product, the t shirt one, that can have multiple different colors and sizes, etc. So for one product that's identified or um, created here, in products, that's going to have multiple sub products. So let's go ahead and build that connection. We, there we go. So that's going to be a wrong way around. So for one product, that's going to have multiple. So you can see straight away, we've got the crow's foot over on the sub product to indicate multiple items are connected to this individual product we have in product. So what we're going to now need to do again is create a new uh, foreign key. Now we already have this um, relationship here to the primary key. So what we can now do is just move this up. So we're going to delete that. Let's do that. So we're going to associate the product name as the foreign key. That's going to be the unique identifier across to the product. So let's go ahead and have a look to see what that looks like in data terms. Uh, so product here. So let's go ahead and bring this down here. All right, so sub product is going to have the name. So this is the product name, we'll just say P name. And that's going to be, for example, now, um, well, what we can do here in actual fact is it's probably easier for us to utilize an ID rather than having the primary key as the name, which we can do. But that all depends. In your system, you may have names of products that are the same. Now, there's probably again a rare occasion that's the case, but you need to make that decision whether the name will be unique or not. If the name isn't unique, then it can't be a primary key, of course. So we're going to keep it. Yeah, we're just going to keep it as the primary key for now. So one item here, T-shirt, is related to multiple items in our sub product. And one item is related to one product. That's the relationship. Now, you may also have said, no, in actual fact, multiple products are related to one product here. But remember the, the rules here that if we work from left to right, so if we start with sub product, we say one item. If we start from this direction, we say one product. That's the key here. So one sub product is related to multiple, or it's a weight related to one product here. But one product here is related to multiple items on this side. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to build this reference over from sub product to product. So we've done that. And now we have a foreign key for a reference point over to product. Now, I was suggesting actual fact that we add ID here. So that will be one. 
So this will now be ID, as in product ID. And we can then reference that over just using a value like this. So one referencing this row here. So you may choose to work in that way instead. I'm just going to swap that back. I'm just going to work like this for now. OK, so let's move on to the next step. So one to many and one's one equals one to many. So that's that relationship now sorted. So now we're going to go ahead and product and category. So let's start with an individual category. So one category relates to multiple products because one category be, for example, shoes. Now, multiple products are going to be related to that category. So there's a one to many. So one category to many products. One product will relate to how many categories? So we know that's going to be many because remember, a product could be related to multiple categories. So in actual case, in this case, we now have a one to many from category to product. So one category might be found in many products and then one product may have multiple categories. So we have a many to many relationship here. So what we do here is a one to many plus one to many equals many to many relationship. Right. So in this case, what we need to do, um, let's just start off by building that relationship. So what we need to do here is just identify the error. So that side and that side. Nope. Let's do that again. So we need to change that to many to many. So we'll do that for now. There's another process we need to go through in a second, but that's a many to many to relationship. So now we can probably just go ahead and let's have a look at the rest. Hopefully you understand at this point. So one product may have many images, but one image is related to one product. So we have a one to many this way. So one product may have many images, but one image might only be associated to one product. Now, it might be the case that one image is used to lies in multiple products. You may have some generic images, in which case you've got a many to many relationship here. But we're not going to say that is the case in our scenario. So let's go ahead and do this. So one to many. One to many. Now, what we've seen here is the many side, the table connected with many, we're going to need a foreign key, a reference over to the table here. So what we've got here in actual fact is something already set up, the SKU. So let's utilize that. So we're going to say SKU ID. And that's going to be the foreign key here in this instance. And that's then going to reference the image across to the product. So back into our media here, this is going to be a foreign key uh, ID that's going to relate back to an image. So you can see here that we've got multiple images related to the product 111 and we've got multiple IDs. So it's unique ID throughout. And that's what we're going to do and that's what we're going to, yeah, that's how we're going to store the data here. So we can collect multiple images related to this product from the media table. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next, which is, let's do, for example, size. So similar to color, it's going to be the same type of situation here. We're going to need to add an ID here and give that a primary key. And then this time we're going to have a similar situation whereby we need to create a one to many. So, so one size might be utilized by many products, but one product will have one size. And there we go. So we have a one to one and a one to many. So therefore we have a one to many connection. So let's go ahead and create a, let's create a new field. We call that size. That's going to be a size. Yeah, that's going to be a foreign key. And then we go ahead and wait, play style. And then we connect up the size here. So this is going to be a one to many connection. So for one size, there's many products. So there's a lot of products with the same size, but for one product, there's just one size. 
So that's our connection. And now we're going to do brand. So I can't remember what we said now, if there's going to be multiple brands or not. So for one brand, there are multiple sub products. And then for, in this case, it would be the case that uh, for a single product might have multiple brands. So here we have a many to many relationship between brand and sub product. It's annoying. I do apologize. I have to keep um, flicking up and down here. Uh, let's just zoom out slightly. Okay. So yeah, so we have a many to many connection here, but I'm going to just change my mind here and say that in actual fact, a product will just have um, one brand. Let's just keep it simple um, for now. So um, this is just going to be a one to many relationship. So what we can do here is let's just get rid of this field here, or this row, sorry. And now we've got an ID and brand name. So similar to a situation here, what we now have is just brand names recorded and there's no duplication. So we're reducing the redundancy in this table by doing this. And what we can now do is just insert a new row. Let's just call that brand. This is going to be a foreign key because this is going to be the many side of our connection. So let's go ahead and just paste that. We're then going to build that and then there we go. So many. So it's because it's many on this side, we need a foreign key, a relationship or a relatable field over to the table so we can follow the data over to this table. Right. And there we go. So we've now configured all of our relationships in this set of tables. So what to tell you about many to many relationships. So if you do have a many to many relationship in your set of tables, typically you need to deal with that in a particular way. So the problem here is that many to many relationships have some general peculiarities. Um, it can cause duplication and duplicated data in both tables. So generally what we want to do is deal with a many to many relationship. And sometimes we call this building a, a link table, for example. So what we end up doing here is building a new table. Okay. So we're going to call this, uh, the product category table. And what we need to do here is we need to build a link, a relationship. So we're going to take the primary key in the product and make that into a foreign key. Oh. And then we take the primary key from the category. So that's going to be, I'm just going to call that cat ID. It's going to be a foreign key. And then what we're going to do here is just keep this ID in here. It's a unique key. Uh, so there we go. So what we now do is we relate this to this is a foreign key. So it's going to be the, it's going to have the crow's feet. Uh, so ID there. Okay. So what we have now is a link table. So inside of this table, um, we can now actual fact, we can get rid of the product name here. We don't need that anymore because that's going to be linked here. So let's just get rid of that, delete that row. Um, let's just uh, move that to there. So now what we've done is we've reduced the redundancy in the category field in table because we're now lo no longer storing the product. So all we have here is the actual category names. So we're not duplicating any data anymore here. Um, so in actual fact, we're just going to call this ID and cat name. So it's going to be the primary key in the category. And that's going to be related here to this table here. So in this table, you can see that we're going to store the product ID about a particular product and then the foreign key in category. So if we wanted duplicate if we wanted products to be related to duplicate categories in this category table, we'd have ID one product, say number one category, number one, which relates to say the category Django. And then what we can have now in this table is again, ID two, which is unique product name, uh, product number one again. And then this time it might be category two, which is for example, category book. So we can now store all the fields inside of this link table without having to kind of duplicate data in the category. 
and we now have eradicated the many-to-many -many relationship between product and category. So let's take a look at this, compare this to the end or the example that I've shown you so far. And you can see that in actual fact, we're starting to see the shape of this. We have category, we have the product category, we have product, we have product infantry. We also have, for example, brand. We don't have a stock table yet, and we don't currently have all these attributes, but we have the media. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six of the tables already formulated. So now we've gone through those stages, hopefully you can start to see the database forming here. Let's go through some more table refinements. Now let's just go back to our mission objective. We need to maintain information on multiple types of products. Okay, so we need to test our design against this. So let's imagine we had a telly. We want to now store this product inside of our database. Color, size, what about screen size? So at the moment, our database isn't very flexible to allow for this new data that we want to store. We'd have to actually create some new tables that would be associated to the attributes of a television, for example, that we want to sell. And that's going to cost us a lot of time. Uh, that's going to take a, a lot of development potentially to redevelop this database and all the code and so on. So maybe we can tackle this problem before we start building our application. So what I see here is that these tables here are storing attributes about the product. And we need to make these dynamic to allow us to store multiple types of attributes as and when we want to store new attributes about different products we want to start selling. So we can go ahead and define subject again, because remember uh, the subject is referring to a particular table. So a subject database is a collection of specialized information with a narrow focus. So hmm, when we start to actually define what a subject is, it leads us to potentially this idea of that these attributes are a subject or they're an entity that we want to model. So instead of thinking about attributes as individual attributes, which we could do for certain cases, we could think about attributes as a, an individual entity. So a thing that we want to model. So now we need to put all of our skills into practice again to build some, uh, some more tables. But this time, instead of starting from the fields, we could potentially start from the subject because we know, or we've identified if you like, um, that we're going to need a, a table called attribute because we want to model the attributes. Uh, so let's go ahead and build this table. So here, for example, I've created a product attribute table, just thinking about what I'm going to need to include here. So I'm going to need the name, maybe a description. So we've got name, color, description, value, multiple values, and then that's connected to um, the SKU or the product. So I've associated these values uh, to the SKU here um, because these attributes here have kind of come out from the sub product, if you remember. We drew that out from the sub product. So that's just telling me that um, we should link this back to the sub product because we want to know the values or we want to know the attributes of each item here in the sub product table. So we need a link here from product attribute to sub product. Okay, so you can see here that we've got multi value tables or multi value uh, rows here or fields, sorry, multi value fields. So what we want to do is break this down further. So let's take out the multi values. Now, there's a one to one correlation here again, because for one SKU, there is one value. So I'm going to move this across here because they're related, remember. Uh, so for example, now what I can do in this table is have blue, uh, yellow, red, etc., And that's going to then be related to the one product. So by changing that table, that's allowed me to kind of uh, do that. Okay, and now over on this side, obviously we're going to need to bring over a one of the unique identifiers. So let's go for name. That's going to kind of bridge back to the product attribute table. This is what we learned earlier. So we're going to need to bring one of those across. So now we have two tables, one product attribute, and then we can call this product 
values. So now we have two tables, product attribute and product values. So you can see by doing that, of course, we've reduced the redundancy in this table because there's only going to be one instance now of color. Here we do have redundancy, but that's minimal. We can deal with that. That's not a problem because what we've done now is we now have individual records and you can see that we're going to need an ID here um, because there's no unique table. So we can go ahead and potentially add in our ID. So let's just build an ID, a generic ID for this. And over on this side, the product attribute, we could use name because we could make the assumption that the name, the attribute is only going to be recorded once. So that's going to be our unique primary key potentially. So we've gone through that process again very quickly, but you can see we put that information, that skill into practice of, of identifying the, the primary keys. So now that's done. So now I've gone ahead in Lucidchart here, I've created the two tables, product attribute, product attribute value. So in addition to the name, I've just decided that I'm going to use a unique ID to identify each row rather than the name, because there may be occasions where the, the attribute name may be very similar or, or the same. So I just want to avoid that by including a, a unique ID for each type of attribute. So now we've got that in place, let's go ahead and now think about the relationship. So for one attribute, there may be multiple values. So for example, color name here in an attribute may have multiple colors, multiple values. So what we can say here is there's a relationship, a one to many relationship here. Now for one attribute, for one value or one attribute value, there is one attribute. So here we have a one to one relationship. So therefore we have a one to many relationship. So let's go ahead and build that. So let's go ahead and we've got name here. So this name was referring to, in actual fact, the product value. This is our link back to this table. So what we're going to do here is we're going to call this not name. Now it's going to be the uh, product attribute. Um, I'm just summarizing here rebute id or maybe i don't want to call it that but there we go so product attribute id that's a foreign key because remember the crows foot here is on the right hand side so we're going to need to build a foreign key here okay so that's the connection here so let's just bring this over to this side now so let's have a look here uh, so i'm not too sure why that connection was made, but oh, maybe because there's a table here, I've moved accidentally. Okay, so now we need to build a connection here between the attribute value and the sub product. Now remember, I've put the SKU here and originally because there needs to be a link to this table because sub product has attributes. So there needs to be a link between these tables to, in order for us to get the sub product and then to work out what attributes it has. So there's a relationship here. So let's work out what relationship this is. So let's put that up here, put that up there. So for one attribute, one attribute, say color red value, red, there might be multiple products that are red. So here we have a one to many relationship. So for one value, product value, there might be multiple products with that value, red, green, small, large, whatever. So for one product, one product might have multiple attributes. So we could say here for one product to multiple attributes. So now what we have is a one to many and a many to one, one to many and a one to many relationship. So that gives us a many to many relationship. So now what we need to do, like we did with the product category, we're going to need to build a new link table uh, to store this data. So we're going to call this product um, attribute sub product. So we know kind of the connection here. Uh, so let's go ahead and just do that. So this is our link table. So it's going to have an ID. We're going to take the ID primary key from the product value. So this is going to be product attribute value ID. And then we're going to get the ID here, which is the SKU. 
SKU. So those are both foreign keys to respective tables. So for one, uh, for one product here, there's going to be multiple values. So let's go and do that. So I'm just going to do it from here. One, one to many SKU. So for one product, there are multiple values. And then for multiple, for one value, there is multiple products. So let's go ahead and connect that up. One to many. Okay, so for one item here, it will, will relate to one item here. So value being red, that's going to be related to one item here, one value of red. But one attribute here is going to be utilized multiple times in this table. So we have a one to many relationship here and then a one to one relationship the other way. So there's our link table. So thinking about that, we can now actually see uh, from the original uh, diagram, we now have actually recreated this chain here of tables. So we're even closer now to fully realizing this design. Let's take a look at a new mission objective I've just generated. From my analysis, from, under from understanding what it is I want to be able to achieve from my database and what I want to be able to show, I want to be able to create a predefined set of attributes for each type of product. So for example, what I want to be able to do is say, I want to sell, I want to start selling TVs now. Okay. So what are the attributes of a TV? So screen size, um, power consumption, um, color brand, and so on. So I think about all those attributes. Now, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to create, uh, a piece of data which will collect all those attributes and associate that to a type of product. And then what I can then do in my, for example, admin area, I can select TV and then what appears on the screen is a set of fields that are related to the attributes about a TV that I need to fill in in order for me to actually then create a new product, a new TV product in my database. Now, if you think about if you were going to build a database and then add a TV, what we would need to do is to add those individual attributes every time we add a new TV. And it would get annoying after about the 100th TV. You need to remember every same set of attributes every time you want to build a TV. So by creating this predefined set of attributes for each type of product, it means in the background, when we administrate, when we add new products, we're going to be able to automatically generate a page with all the assigned attributes for that particular type of product. So we can easily fill in and create new products. So we can see from the existing design type here is inside sub product. So there's no way at the moment, me trying to identify all of the different um, values that might be associated to a particular type of product. In addition to that, this type field here, if I were to build lots of data, this type would be duplicated multiple times. There'd be a lot of data redundancy here. So maybe this is going to be better suited in its own table. By doing that, like brand, um, we'll be able to add an ID and then type, and we only need to create a type once. So there will only be um, one type of product in the new table added once, whereas here type is going to be added multiple times for each product that we create. So in addition to that, if I can relate type to, for example, product value attribute values, I can then now create a new table and record based upon the type all the attributes that are associated to that particular type. And then through some magical querying, I'll be able to collect all the different attributes that are associated to the particular type of product I want to store. So let's go ahead and build a new table here. I'm going to call this type. Okay. So type now is going to be a, it's going to be a foreign key. So it's going to be type ID foreign key. So here what I'm doing is I'm working 
based upon all the rules that we set up. Because why is that going to be an ID? Because we need to build an association now. So let's just uh, finish off by saying type ID, and then we're going to have type name, right? Okay. So for one type, there are going to be many products. For one product, it's going to have one type. So we're going to say that we're not going to say that there are many, a product will have many types. So it's just a one to one. So we have a one to one relationship from sub product to type and then a one to many. So what we built here is a one to many connection. So let's go ahead and build that to type. Okay. So that's that now connected. And because we've got the crow's foot here on this side, we're going to need a foreign key, a reference point back to type. Okay. So that deals with that. So now what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to build a table which will store information related to type. So we're going to need to build an association. So I think in my original design, I connected project attribute value to type. But let's just go back here. So we want to create a predefined set of attributes for each type of product. So we want to basically connect attributes to a type of product. So should it not be product attribute in actual fact connected to type? So what we're going to say here for each type for one, sorry, for one type, maybe type being t-shirt or type being telly or type being shoes for one type that will have multiple attributes. We know that. So we can then find the name. We can attach that to the name and so on. So for one attribute, one attribute might be included in multiple types. So for example, color is going to be in the type um, shoes and it's going to be in the type telly. So what we have here is a many, many to connection, right? So what we're now going to do is then create a new table. So let's go ahead and build a new table here. So um, this is going to be a one to many ID to product ID. Obviously, there's going to be now product attribute ID. And then we're going to have a one to many here. So type ID to over here. So type ID. Okay. So let's go ahead and build that. So the, you can see that we're using the same principles like we had done. Crow's foot's connected to product category. So therefore the foreign, the foreign keys, whoa, and the foreign keys are inside of the product category. So this category table, product category, obviously I want to call this product attribute uh, type. So what I'm going to store in this table here are attributes from the product attribute table that are related to the type. So if you're not too sure, Let's just put this data in action here. So I've mocked up the three tables, product attribute, uh, product attribute type, the link table here and type. So here we have some attributes. So color, size, and maybe we have something else. Um, height, for example. Okay, so we have our description, whatever that might be. Okay, cool. Right, so product attribute type. So this is our link table. So we have type here, ID one, let's call this shoes. So what we want to do now is identify what attribute shoes has. So ID one, you see a unique number that we're just going to auto increment in our database when we add more data. So we're going to use the product attribute one color, and then that's going to be associated to type ID one to so shoes. Okay. So shoes also has size. So that's going to be ID two, just auto incrementing here. Um, and then this is going to be product ID two. Oh, no one. And then that's type ID one again. So what I can now do is I can query the database and ask the database what attributes are associated with shoes. And what I can now do with this list is I can now only show fields in, for example, if I were now going to add for, and I selected shoes to add in my admin area, I can now generate a page which has fields associated to these attributes because these attributes here, which are described here are associated to shoes. 
So anytime I want to add a shoe product, I can generate this data, query this data, generate a page which shows those attributes that I can fill in. And that way, every time I add shoe data, I don't have to select myself all the different attributes associated with shoes because that's going to cause potential errors because I might have different data that's, that's not associated to shoes accidentally created in the database. So I can start to manage um, and avoid any human error by stipulating and actually specifying what fields are related, attributes are related to individual products. So for example, if I had TV here, um, so obviously that doesn't have as maybe uh, well, that probably has height as well. So ID two, so type two here. Um, so we're going to have three attributes. So this is going to be three, four, and five. Remember that's just our primary key. It needs to be unique. And so here we're going to have one, two, and three, All right? So now my TV is associated to three different attributes. I'm going to use that data to build. When I select TV, create a new TV in my admin area, it's going to show me a table or field set, sorry, that are associated to these attributes only. So when we compare our new table design to the, the existing finalized design, you can see that we have made a change here. So we are connecting our product attribute to the product type attribute values. Notice that this, this end design here has different names. I've been a little bit lazy with my naming throughout, uh, just to kind of speed up this very long tutorial. Uh, so yeah, so there's a few things that we don't have in our design at the moment that's in the final design, and that's the stock table here and some of these fields here. So let me just quickly explain those. So I've decided in my business case that I want to store information about when the product was created, when it was updated, and whether the, the product is active. And that's going to allow me to determine, determine whether I should show that product on the screen or not. And I can do the same thing here with the main product. So here I've got, for example, updated at, created at, is active. So I can then set that to true or false based upon whether this product is available or not in um, my warehouse for me to actually ship out. So in addition to that, I need to think about how I'm actually going to allow users to navigate to a particular product. So what I've done here is I've created this slug field. And this is basically a link to this product or it's going to allow me to kind of build a link, a unique name so I can access this product from a database rather. So this slug, uh, for example, is if I had a product here called Nike shoes, the slug is going to be called Nike shoes. And that's then going to appear in the slug in the URL at the top here. And that's going to allow me to capture that information in Django and then to retrieve that individual piece of data. So these are some other fields that I've added uh, in here to make this viable for me to actually build within Django. So we have a slug here. If you're not too sure about slug, go off and read a little bit about slugs and what they do. In addition to that, I've got two IDs here. So that's a little bit confusing. I won't be following that, but what I've done here is I've created um, a, a way of, this won't be a primary key, uh, what I've done here is on the web, you've got these numbers at the top here. And what I don't want is an instance where, for example, I've got product ID equals one here. And then for example, someone could just type in two and then randomly guess the next product. So I wanted to try and avoid that situation. So by using a unique web ID, that's gonna be a unique number, a random number like this, for example, um, that's going to then prevent that type of ease of kind of moving to the next one in a sequential order for example. So that just protects the ID in this table because it's connected to all these other items. Uh, so there's a little bit of kind of security there, which I may explain at a later point um, as to why that might be useful or implemented in our set of tables here. So that kind of solves that little issue there or just explains that. Um, I may need to do the same thing. If I wanted to show all the products individually, for example, Hollister will show you on the Hollister website, if you have a look at the products, they will show you all the individual products, which is all the different colors. If you wanted to do that, maybe you'd have a slug here on the inventory rather than the product, for example, but we're gonna work from the product and then collect data within the inventory about the product and then display it. So that's pretty much how this is gonna work here. So what you've seen here also, in addition to the tables that we've created previously, is I've created a stock table. I've simply made the decision 
that this is a separate subject I want to store individual information about because once I start filling this up a little bit more, it becomes obvious to me that maybe I am or I am building a separate uh, subject here and these fields represent characteristics of this particular subject, which is the stock. So here, for example, I've got ID, I've got a link here, foreign key to my product inventory table. I've got last checked. So I'm assuming that someone in my company will go around and do stock check now and then to actually count the amount of products I have in my in my inventory. And of course, I want to make sure that no one's stealing any data, any data, stealing any products. So having stock checks makes me I can check to see how many units are sold. And from that, I can then calculate, for example, um, how many units I should have left, for example, based upon the last stock check. So I can potentially, although I can't hear in this list of fields, I can check to see how many products have been sold over the last time. I can check, sorry, how many products have been sold since the last time I stock checked my product. So if I last stock checked my product and there was 10 products and I've sold five products since, but there's only one product left in my store, in my, sorry, in my warehouse, it means that I've kind of lost some products. They've been stolen somehow or misplaced. So I've got that information in here. Uh, we've got units. That's the amount of units that are left in my warehouse of a particular product and then units sold. So that's all related to or these fields, are all kind of characteristics of this subject, which is stock. And you can see then that is then connected via a one to one link. So that's going to be um, linked to the product inventory. So for one item in here, there's one item in the inventory and for one item in the inventory, there's one item in the stock. So we've got a one to one relationship there. And then just finally, weight unit. So here's just a separate table where I'm going to store different types of weights that I might want to allow users to assign um, that particular weight within the weight inventory. So I haven't fully realized this yet, but yet, but it really depends on your business case. So for example, if you sell products with different weights, they may cost more or different monies to send. Now you may just work somewhere or your you may just send out products based upon a flat fee. So what we want to try and do here is potentially, maybe we can realize this later on, is we're going to need to find a way or think of a way, depending on how you want to deal with this, of assigning different types of weights to different products and then to apply that or to uh, be able to assign that to different types of um, costs. So for example, here, what we might do is have a table called um, delivery cost. And it might say 100 kilograms equals four pound, 200 grams, kilograms equals whatever, 200 pound, 300 kilograms equals 300 pound to send. So what we can then do is in here, we could define the weight in kilograms, and then we can then obviously work out the cost based upon the, the weight cost and the weight that's identified in the product inventory table. So that's another way we can work. But the problem here is that we're potentially creating kind of static. Um, well, that's maybe a good way of working. So we could have a table, like I said, which identifies the weight and the price. We'd obviously need to, um, that's another thing, we would have to manually update that as the price changes. And what we could do probably in real in realistic terms is we could probably hook into a, a post API so the Royal Mail here in the UK API, and it can automatically work out the price for you. Maybe that's just a different way. So and there may be occasions where you want to define different weights for different products. Um, so yeah, the, the weight unit table, that was just going to be an idea that I was going to expand on later. You can just ignore it for now. So can we comfortably say now we've met our mission objectives? We're maintaining information on multiple types of products, yes. We're keeping track of stock levels, yes. And we also create a predefined set of attributes. We're also able to create a predefined set of attributes for each type of product. And that's gonna allow us to build a, a, a more defined admin interface for individual products so that we can display the fields that are associated to that product so the user can only enter data about those fields about that particular product. That's going to save us time in the long run and prevent any um, 
human errors entering wrong type of attributes into the database. And from the website side, we could also use this data to identify what attributes we want to actually use on the page. And that is also maybe how we can utilize this data too. So hopefully now we can say loosely that we've met our mission statement for this database design. Uh, so we've, de we've developed the infantry app database to maintain the data that is needed to support online retail sales and stock infantry management. So that just leads me to say thank you very much for listening. I need to say a big thank you to all the sponsors that I have now on this channel. Um, thank you very much for your support. Um, it's crazy, um, but thank you very much. And yeah, if you do want to support this channel further, then please consider joining the members area for a small fee. And that helps towards realizing my dream of not having to go to work and to make more tutorials. Hopefully this tutorial was useful. Remember in the next tutorial, we're gonna now realize this database with Django. We're gonna start setting all that up and that's when the fun begins. So thank you very much again for listening and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.